Well, the conversation came to be uh, rooted in a conversation I overheard these two women who are also part of Code Pink. Uh, we were sitting together in the cafeteria during the uh, March for Science where it was pouring rain outside. We came inside to get warm and to uh, have some lunch. And they were sitting right next to me and started talking about what they had learned about each other. Certainly, I think there was a, a, a deeper understanding of one another's stories and, and the ability to, to, for each of them to articulate that, that what they both want and each want is, is a peaceful country and a peaceful world. So uh, as they saw one another, and I hope so, uh, or this conversation as a contribution to, uh, to tipping that balance from, from war making and strife to mutual appreciation. Marwa is a Saudi woman and Layla is a, an Iranian woman. They each grew up in their respective countries and learned some interesting things about one another and mostly about one another's countries. And as I listened to them, I thought, oh, I would love other people to hear this conversation. So I asked them if they would be interviewed, and the result is here. I'm, uh, I'm Leila, and um, I'm from Iran originally. Um, currently, I live in Maryland. Uh, I'm Marwa, I'm from Saudi Arabia, and now I live in DC. So part of the conversation that, that inspired me to ask you to continue it was you're talking about the stories you had heard about one another's countries and about one another's peoples, um, because peoples are much more than countries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I thought it would be a very important conversation for our listeners to hear, because these are conversations we don't often engage in. So, uh, so you grew up in Iran? I grew up in Iran and um, being from Iran and being from Middle East, uh, I always felt that I know everything about the Middle East. Um, and then in, it happened that in 2009, 2010, I traveled around um, in the area, in the region. And first of all, I was very surprised um, of lack of knowledge that I had toward other Middle Eastern people, other people in the Middle East. Um, interestingly, I felt that we were very close um, culturally to Jewish people, to Israeli people. And also I felt Arabs are not just one Arab. It's there are many different cultures, even many different language and dialect. I was very surprised to learn that. Um, but also um, I learned that um, misunderstanding between us, you know, Iranians, we are um, we are different um, from the uh, language perspective and also religion perspective, religious perspective in the region. We are Persian. The majority of Middle Easterns are Arab. We are not all Persian. In Iran, we have Arab Iranian, we have Turk Iranian, Kurdish Iranian. But um, again, we know ourselves as Iranian, just one specific geographic. And then we, we know that ourselves, we are very different from other people in the region. We are good, we have, um, we are better. And I always tell my friends that we have this in common with Americans. We always feel that we are the best. <laughs> uh, that exceptionalism is not just America. Yeah. Well, uh, for me, I was born and grew up in Saudi Arabia and um, I consider myself to know a little about Iran because of the religious point of view and also I read some uh, things about the Iranian revolution and how things changed in Iran but what most of Saudi people think or what the government exactly wants them to think is that Iranians aren't good Muslims and Iran is the biggest threat to Saudi Arabia and to other countries in the region. But um, it's mostly used out of um, the government wanting to control people and wanting people to have something to be scared of. Another thing you have in common with the United States. Yeah, oh, we think, we think that we are better, of course, too. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I think everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> so so you're, you're both women, and, uh, and certainly 
we're, we're very aware of the uh, restrictions on women's lives in Saudi Arabia. And, and I wonder how that plays into the, the perceptions you have of one another and, uh, and how, how you overcome that. I mean, to be honest, I wasn't really into the image that the Saudi government wanted us to have. And again, it's just because I know that they're doing this out of sectarianism and wanting to control people <coughs> since the beginning. So I didn't pretty much had this like, uh, no, Iranian people are bad or they are a threat to us. But I can say that majority of Saudi people did. I mean, one of the places that that's that's really very much punctuated, if you will, is that uh, the two powers in the Middle East are Saudi Arabia and Iran, mm -hmm. and and this tension between you, and and so one of the things that that I, as someone who would like us to find common ground, mm -hmm. I mean certainly your gender is a common ground, our gender mm -hmm. is a common ground, but also wanting to live in peace, wanting mm -hmm. to live without fear, without tension. Mm -hmm. um, you may keep the, the idea of your exceptionalism. Yeah. I think that's something that, uh, that we can just sort of put to the side. Yeah. But you, you each grew up hearing stories about the other country and about perhaps women in the other countries. And I'm curious about what, you, what, you, what ideas you formed about the other. Um, yeah. um, I just first I want to say I absolutely agree with what Marwa said that majority of us under the influence of our government um, the feeling that we have toward one another basically is from them they are dictating those kind of knowledge or lack of it to us and they want us to hate one another without knowing each other it's exactly like the United States, for example, Americans and Iran, or or I don't know, Syrians, or many many of many of us in the world, and um, this is the same. Our governments are using the hatred, using the fear, and using probably religious cards sometimes to uh, make us to not to like one another, um, and this is very important, I think. Um, even I, I know myself as an activist, as a person who are open to many of the different ideas, but I always thought um, Arab women, specifically peop uh, women from Saudi Arabia, um, are very oppressed. And if I, I saw Marwa for the first time and I thought if she's not covering herself, that means she's very rebellious. She probably never was like this in Saudi, but she informed me that although there are some, like in Iran, there are a certain dress code that is by force, but still we have our own ways to um, act the way that we want. Um, another thing I wanted to add is the way that we can see the common ground among ourselves. I respect this idea a lot, and I think like, I, I would say, I have kids, Marwa doesn't, but I would say, you know, I love my kids as much as Marwa's parents love her. And I, I don't want to see a day that my kids would hate her or my kids would um, be ready to kill her or her family. And at the, same, at the same time, I don't want her family be ready to kill my family. And unfortunately, if we don't have this relationship that our government are trying to not to not allow us to have this relationship or to knowing one another this the animosity will will come and unfortunately you know it the situation is really ready right now and it's a scary i'm scared and uh, i'm afraid of the situation in which it's a scary and it's possible that it will take everyone into it Uh, I'm going to speak about the common grounds between the two governments because the two governments hate each other but they're actually to me are very similar they mm -hmm. both rule by religion and they are both oppressive and especially oppressing women yes we have ways to express ourselves and maybe yes we repeal and do stuff but we are still oppressed as women in Iran and in Saudi and it's not that different, to be honest. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, even even about freedom of speech, about uh, being wanting reform or being against the government, you can be killed or you can uh, sent to jail for years and years in both countries. So, ironically, mm -hmm. they are very similar. I want to add to this that I, I think, from my perspective, I think both government, although they are religious, but they use religion as taking their own agenda yeah. and, you know, to go forward with their own political and power agenda, not really religion per se. Um, Saudi Arabia is accusing Iran of supporting Shias in Yemen. Um, Iranians are accusing Saudi Arabia of supporting Sunnis in Syria. And they are using this religion perspective or differences to just have their own power gain. So how do you see out of this? You know, this is one small conversation between two women from these two countries. And, and I really appreciate you're both saying it's the governments who are, are using religion, mm -hmm. for example, for their own power. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and how you see yourselves and other women in, in your countries uh, countering that. I see it a little difficult, um, and I see, you know, over here in this small gathering that we have, I see myself as responsible to go back to my people, to my community, and probably take Marwa over there and say, oh, this is my friend from Saudi Arabia, and they will see, they, you know, it, it, and I really would like Marwa to do that, because little by little, we can really do that, but on the other hand, if I'm thinking about a bigger community, you know, going to Iran, for example, and have a campaign and said, let's be friends with Saudi women, it's kind of, it's far from <laughs> even a dream. It's very difficult to do that. Yeah, I can imagine being the same in Saudi too, although I've been to Iran before, mm -hmm. and yeah, the image of Iran before was vague before me going there, but after going there, I actually encourage people to go and I tell them it's a beautiful country and it has a lot of history and deep roots. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the one of the things that that I was struck by is since particularly since 9-11, before which many people in, in in the US, many people in the mainstream, um, didn't even think of Muslims. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have, in, in where I live, in Western Massachusetts, we have uh, various, a couple of mosques that we visit and, and, uh, and have this, this a whole community of support and mm. of uh, solidarity mm. with Muslims, particularly when you're being attacked. That's true. And one of the things that's been very interesting is to, is to realize that there isn't a Muslim story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that, uh, that I, I sometimes think of of the, the Sunni Shias as analogous to, but certainly that limping analogy, to, uh, to various Protestants and Catholics. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and my own history is, is in Ireland, where um, it, it was amazing how the government mm -hmm. really yes. got pitted the Catholics mm -hmm. against the Protestants and the mm -hmm. Protestants against mm -hmm. the Catholics. And, and uh, because before the Troubles mm -hmm. in the 60s, uh, Protestants and Catholics lived next door to each other. And there was discrimination, there's no question mm -hmm. about it, particularly in the North. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there was certainly a lot of intermarriage, there mm -hmm. was uh, a lot of socializing mm -hmm. among the different people in, in these different sects. And, uh, and that's a, certainly the story that I've gotten from people in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm curious about in what's you know the the story the similarities in Iran, in Iran and and I think it's quite different in Saudi but maybe not uh, about uh, how people are living together from different sects well you know the the Wahhabism yeah uh, no there is no um, for example generally speaking uh -uh. I mean there are cases of course that are different but generally speaking for example um, Sunni and Shia don't get married from each other, uh, you will see that there are some Shia and Sunni friends. That's yeah. very normal to happen, but getting married from someone from a different sect, no. That's unusual, and even if it happens, I imagine that both families would be unhappy about it. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
but in Iran we have that kind of freedom. Like um, we have many different, besides Sunni and Shia, we have like the Hai, Zoroastrians, Christians, Jews, and Jewish population, for example, in Iran is the biggest out of the Israel in the Middle East. So we have them, and they have representative in the parliament. Um, so there is, there are these freedoms. And I, I remember when I was, you know, growing up, um, I never asked my friends in school that, uh, what is your religion? What is your, you know, are you Sunni or Shia? We never had that. Um, and um, I, I have seen people who marry, you know, in different sects or different religions, um, religious groups. I just want to add here that I think while you were talking, I was thinking a lot of these things also is cultural rather than just a religion because I don't know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like in a, uh, early years of Islam, for example, when we study the history, we see there are different groups, different tribal groups, like Quraysh is more important than others. And probably people from that specific tribe, because they were in a higher level, they, like not they like a caste system, but you know, kind they of, were yeah. in a higher, higher level. They didn't want to marry to, or they didn't want to be related to people who are in a lower level. And probably this kind of culture also came to so because we see in other uh, Arab nations, like in Palestine, in Iraq, in Syria, these are in Egypt. Mm -hmm. People have this intermarriage. Yeah, no, I um, I know what you're talking about about the tribal thing, mm -hmm. and it still exists in Saudi, but it's different than the Shia Sunni thing, because still the Sunni Shia thing is something that is kind of part of the propaganda made mm -hmm. by the government to actually divide people. So yeah, that's no, I didn't different. Mean, I mean, a tribe. I I meant you know in a culture people always think if they belong to a certain group it they cannot they yeah. you know they are better yeah so they, you see that within the sunni people yeah, themselves yeah. and within the shia people themselves yeah. what you're talking yeah, about yeah. but generally speaking still now i mean i don't i don't agree that it's part of the culture i just say it's just because of how Propaganda. yes how the government made us actually feel like we are very different and we should not I mean, when you go to school, to public schools in Saudi Arabia, and you get taught that Shias are not good Muslims, and it's in, in the book, like in the books, in the official books, what do you think people will be like? Mm -hmm. So, so that you're taught that that one that that there's a hierarchy yeah. uh, within the the Muslim religion. It's not kind of higher. I, I mean, it's because uh, the Islam that's being taught in Saudi is the Sunni uh, Wahhabi Islam. So the books in all the schools in Saudi mm -hmm. will teach basically that everyone else is wrong except the uh -huh. Sunni Wahhabi. Mm -hmm. And we, especially Shia, they, they are really brutal against Shia and they always say that they are even worse than Christians and Jews. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So, it's hard to have intermarriages in such a country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I wanted also to add that when we talk about um, Shia, there are many different Shia groups. So, we think the best ones are our <laughs> the ones who have 12 Imams. Um, but uh, we have uh, Shias with 4th Imam, Shias with 7th Imam. Mm -hmm. We have many different, uh, six also, I don't know. Do we have six them all? I don't think so, no. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, for, for our, our listeners who uh, and viewers of this, uh, what does this mean, this 12 imam or six? Uh, uh, I, I say my perspective, and then yeah, you say how much I'm wrong. So, um, after Prophet, there are four caliphs, and um, the Shias in general, they believe the first caliph after Prophet is Ali. Imam Ali and Imam, the letter Imam itself, the word Imam itself means the leader, uh, literally. But also, it's a little more spiritual than just the leader. And then, um, Shia believe Imam Ali was the first caliph and the three others after him. But the Sunni believes that Imam Ali is the fourth caliph. The first is uh, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, 
and then Ali. But then uh, after Ali, and Ali Ma'e is a Prophet's cousin and also son-in-law. So Ali married Prophet's daughter. And out, uh, out of that marriage came two, four kids, two sons, two daughters. And the two sons and then their following sons, till twelfth of them, these are twelfth Imams. Uh -huh. So, and that is the best kind of Shia. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, but also... Yeah, but I we would like to clarify that we don't think that, but that's the way <laughs> the Lord is. <laughs> <laughs> I met someone from Africa and she had 40 Imams. What? Yeah, that's, I've never heard that before. I mean, yeah, me too. Yeah. So, so this is, this is, uh, this is part of the tradition. This is part of the culture. Yeah. How does that, or did that, influence your lives? So I guess Shia, the word Shia again, in general, it means uh, opposition group. And in uh, Shia, the third Imam um, was killed or was uh, mar mm, murdered? Uh, murdered. No, martyr. She, a martyr? Yeah. Martyr. A martyr. She, he became a martyr and with his family. So, and he was against the, he did kind of a revolt against the, uh, against the um, king or caliph of the time. Yeah. And then he, he is the most important, in, at least in Iran, because his death became the symbol of being against the dictatorship, being against the any kind of um, inequality. And um, so because of that, all the ceremonies around him and his life became a kind of public ceremony. So there are days that we don't go to school, we didn't go to school, we had a special ceremonies around him. So he became really important um, character in shaping our belief and our daily life probably. Other than that, I just want to say it in the parentheses, Iranians are not religious um, in general, and so it didn't play a very important role, except the time that people wanted to use those characters in their revolutions, in their uprisings. Yeah. I mean, I, I would like to say something that Shia, uh, it doesn't exactly mean opposing, it means followers of Imam Ali. That's how it started. When you said earlier that the difference is Shia believe mm -hmm. Imam Ali is the first Khalifa. And uh, the Imam um, Layla talked about, which is Imam Hussein, mm -hmm. I agree with her. It's, uh, his story is a big part of the Shia culture all over the world. And um, how it affected our life to be honest i feel like it was something beautiful to have these ceremonies mm -hmm. not only this uh, the the thing leila mentioned is uh, a sad one but there are other stuff like celebrating the prophet for example birthday and other things that for example other most muslims in saudi don't do because they believe mm -hmm. it's against islam or it's not uh, it's not good to do it. I felt like it's nice to have this spirituality and these occasions where you celebrate. May I ask questions? Oh, sure. <laughs> so in Saudi, they don't celebrate like Prophet's birthday or? The Sunnah and Saudi, most Sunnah and Saudi don't because they consider it it's like bid'ah. But the, in the Arab and the other part of the Arab world, like for example, Egypt, yes, they do. Uh. I mean, in Jordan, it was an official uh, holiday, even, but in Saudi, no. Ah. And then another question I have: Did you have the freedom um, on when the, it was um, like in Muharram in Imam Hussein's? Um, in Shia uh, areas, yes. In Shia cities, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, we but, uh, we we had similar ceremonies, but I mean, it's not, of course, like the ones in Iran. Yeah, yeah. in Iran, it's like all over the cities, everywhere in the middle of the streets. It's like a caravan. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, so you didn't have what, that freedom. But did you feel the government or the, you know, the media, which is coming from the government, is controlled by the government, is disrespectful, especially on that time? Or 
I won't say the media a lot and at that time and exactly about the ceremonies themselves but again in, in school in religious books uh, we are told that this is wrong mm -hmm. and this is, should not be done mm -hmm. yeah. it's I mean it's interesting because I, I want to pick up on this because you talk about the festivals and mm -hmm. and the different ceremonies but you started that by saying Iranians are not religious people yeah. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm curious about that because I, I certainly know a lot of people who celebrate things that, uh, that are religious, mm -hmm. in quotes, but, uh, but are not religious people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I don't know if you'd like to say any more about that. Yeah, in, um, probably at the time that my parents were young, it, was, it had more religious meaning or a spiritual meaning, not religious. Now, is, in my time, was more, I'm sorry, but it was more fun because um, after the revolution, there was a lot of um, you know difficulties for youth to get together. But in t that ten days, um, people are in the street for 24 hours a day, and then boys and girls are around, and it's just under name of the because government give uh, permission and freedom for religious exercises and practices. So that is the time. For, um, for people to get together in the street and have more freedom, but also has very his deep historical meaning. Um, and in Iran, for example, um, both at the time of uh, Islamic Revolution in 1979 and also the Green Movement in 2009, uh, that specific timing of year became really important because again, the, um, the ce that celebration of being against the dictatorship and being against the um, zulm, I want to say, I, I, I don't injustice, know, yeah. injustice or anything that it's um, forced by the, by the authorities. So because he stood up against the authority, so it's always the wonderful time for people to get together and um, stand in front of the authorities and in front you know in front of injustice or whatever that they are suffering so those timing was really really important at the time of both islamic revolution and in 2009 so yeah you can say that uh, imam hussein's story is a kind of a symbol for rebellious shia mm -hmm. and i would like to say not only shia because even mm -hmm. gandhi for example got inspired by his story uh -huh. So even if you are not religious, uh, and you kind of get inspired by that, yeah. So how do you see Gandhi being inspired by that? He has uh, he has some quotes uh, about him. I mean, you can read about them, but uh -huh. uh, his story is known throughout history. Uh huh. Although, yeah, it's it's part of the Shia culture, but mm -hmm. yeah. Uh -huh. But I guess also he learned it from Pacha Khan, um, the Pakistani. Muslim friend that mm -hmm. he had. Yes, yeah. yes. Who's really, by and large, been so underplayed. Yes. And, and it's it's really tragic because it is. I know I, I was a, a, a someone who really espoused nonviolence and, and learned a lot yeah. about Gandhi, yeah. and you know subsequently Martin Luther King and others. But but it wasn't until much later that I heard about this Muslim pacifist who yeah. uh, who worked so closely with with Gandhi. Yeah. 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 So we, we hope that this this world of ours lives long enough so that all these yeah. people who have really been out in the margins, yeah. you know, are brought more into the popular understanding yeah. and, and again our <coughs> commonalities of uh, of guess, desire for something other than war making. Oh, of course. I guess um, what I see Marwa, for example, as my friend, um, I wish other people could see us and see how different we are at the same time that we are very similar. A lot of things I don't know about her and probably he, she doesn't know about me. So when people see a Muslim immediately don't think that the Muslim is terrorist, the Muslim is you know, a bad person or you know, this is a, a, not, not people like you but uh, a lot of you know, average people, they think that way. Or you know when they see you know we are not covering ourselves, they probably ask, probably you are not a Muslim. <laughs> yes, you know we are, but so there are many different shades of Muslims. <laughs>
And and so so what I'm I'm curious about though is uh, the Iranian Revolution that you made reference to, and how um, what what the response of people were. Now you weren't born yet, were you? Uh, I was in the first grade. Now everybody knows how old. <laughs> I was in the first grade in uh, at the time of the revolution. Um, it is very complicated that why that revolution happened. There are many, many books written about that. Still, people are discussing that. Um, there are many reasons that why that revolution happened, but also there are many reasons that I personally believe the revolution, and many people also in the very good books that they've written, and that the revolution was not because of religion. Um, but religion became part of that, and religion became a tool to connect many different people with different backgrounds and ideas. Um, so sometimes the government used religion to connect everyone and bring everyone under their own umbrella. Sometimes they use nationality, sometimes, you know, in, then at the time of revolution, religion became um, a tool for the government, for the people who wanted to get rid of the Shah. Um, but that actually, I am sorry to see that, that I am the child of that revolution. People, um, majority of Iranians are under 35, uh, 35 years of you know, age. So we are very young country. And that means majority of us grew up during the Islamic Republic, during this government. And that became one reason that many Iranians are not religious. And um, they never were really that religious, but also now it's a kind of anti-religion. Uh -huh. It's a kind of against religion because they see the religion from their government's point of view and the government didn't do a good job by forcing people to, you know, some their own beliefs and ideas, uh, by using religion for their own agendas. They really took away a very important spiritual, probably, mm, life um, that people could have. They took it away from them. <clears throat> I, I want to stay with this for just a minute and then come back to, to how uh, people in, and certainly you weren't born during it, all of that, but certainly how, how what differences that made, the, the Islamic Revolution in, in Iran influenced the rest of the Middle East and particularly, um, uh, particularly Saudi Arabia. But um, uh, certainly everyone who was aware of, of how bad things were under the Shah, <coughs> that, uh, that there were many factions who were opposed to him uh, there were many secular factions, and uh, and yet the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, moved in mm -hmm. triumphant, mm -hmm. and uh, and and how since that time things have evolved. How you know how as you say now people are not religious, mm -hmm. and uh, and yet that was the that was the yeah. impetus, and and certainly mm -hmm. came down very hard on mm -hmm. on seculars. Yeah, yeah, very hard. Uh, actually, majority of activists of that revolution were Tude Party, which was the uh, Communist Party in Iran. Majority very young people, um, people who mostly actually came to America for the education, and their plan was coming back to Iran, but after the revolution they all stayed here, or if they went back to Iran, they were imprisoned, or they were killed, or they were, during the war they were killed, Iran-Iran war. But Ayatollah Khomeini became a voice of that revolution mainly because um, the place that people could um, escape from the censor of the Shah at the, at the end of, the, of his era, it was mosques. And mosques was under control of the um, religious um, leaders or imams at the time. And then that became a very good place for people to communicate with one another. And um, so the religious groups used that opportunity and majority of other groups, secular groups, they, they came to, with this idea that let us get rid of the Shah and by mosques, having mosques as our own main place to connect with one another, 
and having Ayatollah Khomeini as one leader, uh, he can help us to be all together and we can get rid of the Shah. And when Shah leaves, he, he is an old man and he says himself that I'm going to the um, to back to my own mosques and will continue my religious studies. But he stayed, and mainly because of the war broke out between Iran and Iraq. Yeah. And Iraq, by the help of Saddam Hussein, by the help of um, United States and also Saudis and others, so um, invaded the southern part of Iran. So eight years of war made a lot of, a lot of secular people um, to be quiet. A lot of people, um, the government used the idea of war to put people in jail. Everyone was shut off because we were under attack of the foreign regimes. We couldn't really do anything and eight years was um, long enough for the government, for the, that new government to be really powerful. And I remember, for example, I was a teenager by then, and we couldn't laugh in the streets because someone could come and say, oh, we are in a war, we are losing a lot of you know, young lives, and you are laughing, you don't have any you know, sense, you don't have any feeling. So it was really, war was the main thing uh, in, in, the, in the country. And so at the same time, um, the new government changed the education system everything became very religious. Like in my parents' time, they didn't have to study Arabic, for example, but the new regime ma uh, made it mandatory for us to study Arabic because Arabic was the language of Quran. So um, they enforced a lot of new things. For us, it was easier because we, that was the only thing we knew, but for our parents, it was very difficult to you know, make this change in their life. But again, for us, when we went to college, and especially by the new era of technology, and we became really connected with the rest of the world, and people right now, those who are younger than me, and they are in Iran, they are very angry. And whatever they don't have, they see it from, you know, they say Arabs did that to us because of religion. So they connect Islam with the government and with Arabs. So if they are mad at the Iranian government because they are they have Islam and Iranians think Islam is just it came from Arabs, so they connect that anger toward them uh -huh. sometimes. Unfortunately. <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> you're, you're smiling. What's your I know, so what did that? I do? <laughs> I find it funny that they link the religion to Arabs is like Arabs gave us the religion and gave us problems. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what I want our, our listeners to understand is these are two women who are what I would call local experts. Uh, you're not necessarily experts on Saudi Arabia or the history or the religious influences, nor are you the expert, but, but you have your own lived experience, mm -hmm. which I think is again something that we are fortunately bringing out of the margins. Mm -hmm. We don't have to have uh, usually the outside expert who mm -hmm. talks about the lives of women mm -hmm. in these countries. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but actually you too having your own lived experience, which I think is something that really thickens the story, really makes, um, as you talked about earlier, uh, the, the different flavors of Muslims, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, that that there isn't a monolith mm -hmm. in, in, no. any, in no. anything. It, it, Iranians, Muslims, uh, you, people in the US or mm -hmm. anywhere else. So, um, so I'd, I'd like to continue this conversation. You, uh, you, you really gave a, an interesting story about the influence of the Iranian Revolution, the Islamic mm -hmm. Revolution. And as I said, you were not born yet, but, uh, but what you what you got in, in Saudi Arabia, what learning you got about the Iranians, mm -hmm. who are those people, mm -hmm. and what makes them the, the enemy? <clears throat> well, I think um, when the revolution happened in Iran, uh, the Gulf monarchy saw, us, saw that as a threat. They were afraid that um, people in the Gulf will try to do the same. So I think what happened is 
they mostly crack down on Shia because Shia saw that as hope and for example Shia and Saudi Arabia are minorities and they don't have uh, full rights like other people so um, that was kind of um, threatening uh -huh. to the monarchies in the Gulf they don't want something similar to happen there but nothing actually big came out of it uh -huh. around that time yeah, yeah. the life of Shias in Saudi <coughs> was better before the uh, Iranian revolution no I won't say it was better and um, no I won't say it was, but I would say maybe life in Saudi in general was more open and then during the 80s it became more strict religious um, and maybe that's part of why, how they wanted to mm -hmm. actually control people. And now actually I feel like sectarianism is worse and worse nowadays all over the world, not only in Saudi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the tension yeah, between Saudi and Iran is <coughs> much worse mm -hmm. now than yeah. It has ever been. Now, and, and do you think this is simply the Iranians and the Saudis who are doing this, or, or how does this play this this tension between these two countries, these these two different cultures actually, yeah. get played out by how who, the the question I always ask is who benefits, who benefits yeah. from the oppression of women in Saudi Arabia, the oppression of women in Iran. The, uh, the, the tension between your two countries, you know, who benefits from this? I believe those in power. Oppression of women is, I, I believe, is not only just because they are women, but they are a big group of a society. And by <coughs> controlling them, controlling how to, they should dress, controlling how, where should they go for education, that means controlling a big portion of the society which makes their job easier because they benefit from that. And right now, for example, just the uh, story of Syria, which is really heartbreaking. Who gains? Saudi Arabia is sending a lot of weapons and help to Syria in support of Sunnis. And Iran does the same thing, supporting, they said Shias, there, they don't. Iranian don't say Shia, but they say Ara, um, Assad. We want to support Assad. Assad is legitimate. And they they use their own language, but basically, Syrians are losing everything because of the Syrian people are losing everything because Saudi and Iran are just want to have the ultimate power of the Middle East. That's it. Syria is destroyed and is really heartbreaking to see millions of people are losing everything just because Iranian government and Saudi government want to have the total control of the Middle East. And that means control of the economy of the world and basically the politics of the world because we should, we should remember 60% of the oil, 60% of the economy of the world it passed from the Middle East. Forty-five percent of that passing from the Persian Gulf in that small area. And everybody, Saudi and Iran, and of course United States and Russia, everybody wants to have a control of that area. And it's not, I believe, it's not about Shia or Sunni, it's not about Assad or ISIS, it's, not, it's just the control of that um, resource. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, as Leila said, religion is just a tool yeah, to control people and to gain power over them. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you were saying that, I was thinking about our own President Trump just recently uh, having this, this big rally last week <laughs> and, uh, and really pumping up the, uh, the religious fervor, because this yeah. is really the religious right he's mm -hmm. really appealing to, the mm -hmm. Christian religious mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, making the demons, the Muslims, and uh, any foreigners. And, uh, <coughs> and I think, I, mean, I, I certainly agree that, that religion is a tool, and, uh, and one, of the, 
one of the ways out of that that I see is education. Mm -hmm. That uh, this is a terribly undereducated populace yeah. here in this country. That uh, everywhere. Yes, mm -hmm. and so, uh, but I don't think it's just one thing. And I'm curious what what you think are ways out. You know, you're you're one generation beyond me, and you're two. So I'm I'm curious about what what you as as women growing up in your generation uh, see as, as possibilities mm -hmm. forward? I think uh, change has to come from the people themselves. They have, you know, they have all the sources. We're a very open world right now. They have the internet, they have um, a lot of things to take in and use their brain and in, in what, what it's true and what's not. And it's very hard to get out of this mess while you are being taught things like this in schools, while you are being, while you are hearing things like this all the time on the media. But um, I think it's mostly because of people not knowing the other part or the other group, and what people do know are mostly they're afraid of. It's like something vague or strange to them. So we should get to know each other. And as Layla said before, I wish we can, yes, build bridges and get to know each other as people, despite the fact that what sect are we from or what nationality are we? I think you both said that. I heard that the same thing, because you said education, but Marwa eloquently explained it, that yes, when we don't know each other, uh, so that makes everything dangerous. So I guess you meant that education again, let's educate ourselves and educate and let other people around us know what we know. That um, I, I, I think this is very important. You know, like myself, I, um, I am so proud of myself because a couple of years ago, more than a decade ago, when I left Iran, I had the same view toward Arabs, for example, that many Iranians have today. Today, I'm ashamed of that view that I had, and I'm ashamed of friends whom I have, and they talk about Arabs, or they talk about other people in, in a different, you know, in not respectful. And um, often, I'm in a fight with these people, um, in a lack of in finding, finding any other words, to say, um, I know myself, I didn't like Arabs because I didn't know them. Uh -huh. Because I didn't know anything about them. I just heard it and I just, um, I heard it from the second or third, um, um, I, I forgot the word, but the, not directly, mm -hmm. indirectly I've heard about them. And also just based on false information. But when I started to know them, I, 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 I was ashamed of the ideas that I had, of the thinking that I had. And I think this is the way to go. We just need to be open to meet new people, and probably you should invite all your Saudis friends, and I should invite all our Iranians friends, and little by little make our own movement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And do you have any, any final thoughts? Yourself? No, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate this, and I think just the conversation you had is one of the ways we're doing that, yeah. is just getting to know one another mm -hmm. and, uh, and not being threatened. Yeah. You know, that, uh, that I think, you know, when, when, when the powers that be want to keep us separated mm -hmm. and keeping the other, yeah. that, uh, them. that, yeah. That us and them. That when we when we yeah. realize that it's it's all of us, mm -hmm. we're all one human yeah. being. Yeah. And also, I think this country. Amazing thing about this country is this situation. You know, because if Marwa comes to Iran and I'm in Iran, I never go forward, and we never find a chance to talk to one another. You know, she comes probably as a visit, and I leave there, or mm -hmm. vice versa. But the United States, people from all different parts of the world, different walks of the life 
they come and they see each other and they know about each other. This is the beautiful things about this country. Diversity. Exactly. That's and why there shall be no ban and no wall. Exactly. <laughs> there, there. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think this is the best that we have to offer. Yeah. And, uh, and the more we do this, the more we tip the balance toward that. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King said, uh, you know, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Justin. And what I add to that is, it only bends toward justice when we put our weight on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, exactly. uh, and that's what you're both doing in this conversation. So thank you both very much for thank this. You. Thank you.